As machine learning has taken off in the last few years, the increased demand for specialized computing resources for training and prediction has led to the development of tensor processing units, or TPUs. But where do they come from and how do they work on the inside? Stay tuned to find out. Welcome to AI Adventures, where we explore the art, science, and tools of machine learning. My name is Yufang Guo, and on this episode, we're going to begin a two-part adventure into the world of high-performance computing at Google. In the first episode, we'll look at the original TPU, its design, and how it came to be used in everything from Google Photos to Google Translate. Then in the second episode, we'll talk about TPU v2 and v3 and learn about how they work to enable the next generation of machine learning. The trouble with modern computing is that we keep wanting more processing power. Unfortunately, we're beginning to run into the very limits of physics. At least, this is very true for general purpose processors, which is what you might find in your everyday laptop or smartphone. The need for more specific computational power is what led to the first tensor processing unit to be created. Understanding the original designs of the TPU and why it was built that way can help us as we look forwards towards designing machine learning architecture and software systems in the future. The first tensor processing unit was built as a PCI Express expansion card, and it was plugged straight into existing server racks in Google data centers. It had a 700 megahertz clock speed and had 40 watts of power consumption, and it's been in production since 2015, powering things like Search, Translate, Photos, and of course, famously featured in the AlphaGo match in South Korea. Not only was the TPU V1 much more performant than the existing CPUs and GPUs of the time, it importantly had a much higher performance per watt of energy. These two effects combined to make the first TPU a very effective chip. The chip featured an architecture that was specific for deep learning. It utilized reduced precision, a matrix processor, and a minimal design to reduce overhead. Let's look at each of these now in turn. Neural networks boil down to a rich set of matrix multiplications and additions. The team decided to reduce the precision of the chip using just 8-bit integers rather than the conventional 32-bit floating point numbers. And using a technique called quantization, they could convert or map 32-bit floating point numbers to 8-bit integers. So this allowed significantly more integer multiplier units to be fit into a single chip. So speaking of which, let's talk about that matrix processor. Conventional processing systems read and write to memory very often, sometimes after every single operation. This is because they do general purpose processing. So in order to support many different kinds of operations, the hardware design must necessarily be fairly generic. However, this leads to bottlenecks due to all of those memory accesses back and forth. So what if we could build a special purpose processor that performed a much more limited set of operations, but did so more quickly? This is what the TPU tries to do with its matrix processor. It uses what's called a systolic array in order to do a large, hardwired matrix calculation without memory access. One analogy I've seen used to describe this is that a CPU is like printing out letters one by one, stamping them out, whereas a GPU is printing out a whole line at a time, while a TPU, it's stamping out entire pages at a time. The core of the TPU is a huge systolic array, performing up to 250,000 operations per clock cycle. Most of the chip is dedicated to this matrix multiplication followed by addition operations. Even though the clock speed is a seemingly paltry 700 megahertz, it is performing a ton of operations every clock cycle. And one final note about all of this is that it is important to remember that in order to achieve this design, the TPU version 1 only did predictions. Now, you can't get your hands on the TPU v1 or even use it directly. But every time you use something like Google Photos or Google Translate, there's probably a TPU powering your search somewhere. 
On the next episode of AI Adventures, we'll talk about the TPU v2 and v3 and how they work and how to get your code to run on a TPU. Don't miss it. Thanks for watching this episode of Cloud AI Adventures, and if you enjoyed it, be sure to click that like button and subscribe to get all the latest episodes right when they come out. If you're hungry for more TPU v1 action, you can read the paper that the team published about the TPU. I've linked to it in the description down below.